Hello and welcome to all the attendees to this session, the discussion on principles of reflectionless filters. And this is to be the speaker, the honorable speaker, as you can see over here, is Dr. Matthew Morgan, who is a scientist and research engineer of National Radio Astronomy Observatory, the Central Development Laboratory, Caltech, Virginia, USA. We, this talk has been uh, organized by the IEEE student chapter and the IEEE MTTS Society of University of Engineering and Management and IEM, Institute of Engineering and Management. So uh, a little about the speaker, our honorable speaker, Dr. Matthew. Matthew Morgan received his BS in Electrical Engineering from the University of Virginia in 1999 and his MS and PhD in Electrical Engineering from the California Institute of Technology in 2001 and 2003 respectively. Dr. Morgan began his career at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, CA, where he conducted research in the development of monolithic millimeter wave integrated circuits and MMIC best receiver components for atmospheric radiometers laboratory instrumentation and deep space communications. He is now a tenured scientist at the National Radio Astronomy Observatory's Central Development Lab at Charlottesville, VA, where he leads the integrated receiver development program and is involved in the design and development of low noise receivers, components, and novel concepts for radio astronomy instrumentation in the CM, in the centimeter wave, millimeter wave, and some millimeter wave frequency ranges. He has authored over 60 papers and holds 17 patents in the areas of MMIC design, millimeter wave system integration, reflectionless filter development, high-speed serial communication, and ultra-wideband millimeter wave antennas. He has published two books, Reflectionless Filters, and principles of RF and microwave design, both available from Artec House and has a forthcoming book entitled Relativistic Field Theory for Microwave Engineers, describing the relationship between classical electromagnetics and special relativity. About this talk, very shortly, because uh, Dr. Matthew is there to deliver the talk, but very short, in a very short way, I just say, this will cover the fundamental principles of reflectionless, reflectionless filters, a fascinating niche of electronic filter theory, which has experienced a resurgence of interest in recent years due to discovery of topologies that can realize classically optimal transfer functions. So uh, with zero flat loss and zero reflection coefficient at all frequencies, pass band, stop band, and transition band, limited only by the ideality of the practical uh, components used. I will not go more into the details of the topic because Dr. Matthew is there with us. Uh, Dr. Matthew, it's all over to you. I thank you on behalf of Enter IEM and UEM group for accepting this invitation. We are all eagerly waiting to hear from you. Our teachers, our students, our research scholars are all waiting uh, for you to hear. At right now, it's 423 attendees. I request you to take it over all from here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to talk to you all today. It's a real pleasure. Um, so as, as has been said, I work with the National Radio Astronomy Observatory. Um, this, uh, by the way, this, the title screen here, this is one of our dishes on the very large array uh, in New Mexico. I hope everybody is seeing this clearly. Uh, if not, just interrupt me, but I'll, I'll go ahead and uh, continue. Um, so my talk, as he said, is the principles of reflectionless filters. Uh, let's see. There we go. So here's the outline of my talk. I'm going to begin just by talking a little bit about uh, what it's like working in radio astronomy and um, what we do at NRAO. Um, then I'm going to get into the main technical topic of the talk, which is the reflectionless filter technology. I'll talk about what that is and, and why it's uh, beneficial uh, in system design. I'll go over uh, derivations of the lumped element topologies for these kinds of filters. Uh, then I'll present some practical implementations, and if there's time at the end, I'll talk about some transmission line derivations as well. 
So about uh, NRAO and radio astronomy, uh, we currently operate uh, four primary radio uh, astronomy facilities. Uh, the first, one of the more popular, especially in the movies, is the Very Large Array in New Mexico. Uh, it was recently upgraded at, uh, maybe 10 years ago. Um, the, the dishes themselves were actually built several decades ago, but uh, we recently uh, essentially replaced all of the electronics uh, inside with much more sensitive, much broader bandwidth uh, electronics packages. So it's really kind of a whole new uh, telescope array, which was rechristened the Jansky Very Large Array in New Mexico. I'm actually told this is one of the most uh, productive uh, astronomical instruments uh, that in the world, second to second only to the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, as measured by the number of uh, publications, astronomical astrophysics publications that are published each year. Um, Anyway, it consists of uh, 27 antennas. Uh, they are movable, uh, so that you have you can have different uh, spacings on the ground. Each antenna is 25 meters in diameter, and it operates uh, over a frequency range of about 1 to 50 gigahertz. <clears throat> uh, another array that's a little lesser known is called the Very Long Baseline Array. Uh, the antennas are actually very similar. Uh, they're also 25 meters in diameter. They're a bit more precise than the VLA antennas, uh, allowing it to operate to a higher frequency, in this case from 300 megahertz to about 96 gigahertz. Um, there's 10 antennas and they're actually spread out, uh, as you can see here on the globe, over the Western hemisphere, uh, uh, thus giving you very high resolution uh, imaging on the sky. They do all operate as one telescope. Uh, routinely. We also can occasionally uh, link up these telescopes with some of the other telescopes around the world to do even, even more sensitive uh, higher resolution imaging. Uh, and I should just point out, uh, this uh, I can't show them all, but these are a couple of our telescopes. This is one in uh, Owens Valley in California and then another on top of Mauna Kea in Hawaii. Uh, this is another telescope that's recently completed uh, down in Chile. Uh, I love this picture because of the uh, local wildlife. I think it's just adorable. Um, but uh, it's called the Atacama Large Millimeter Telescope, or ALMA, uh, uh, again, located in Chile at a very high altitude site. Uh, this is our highest frequency instrument at the moment, um, operating from 31 gigahertz to nearly a terahertz. Uh, the antennas are relatively small by our standards, uh, 7 to 12 meters. Um, but that's so that they can have that very precise uh, surface uh, needed to image at that high of a frequency, as well as the very precise uh, pointing. And of course, we located them at this high altitude site in the Atacama Desert in Chile uh, to get above uh, the atmosphere, a very dry high altitude site. And it has uh, uh, si about 66 antennas, plus or minus, depending on how many are being maintained at any particular given time. Um, and then the last main facility we have is the Green Bank Telescope uh, in West Virginia. Um, this operates as a single antenna, uh, but it is a, it's a true monster. Just to kind of give you a sense of scale, there's a couple of trucks here you can see on the ground uh, to show you just how big this telescope is. It's almost uh, two football fields in terms of collecting area, uh, 100 meters in diameter, and it operates from 290 megahertz to 116 gigahertz. Um, I should say that there's actually several other, there's another dozen or so antennas on the site. Many of them are in mothballs because they're really historical and uh, have been supplanted by uh, uh, superior telescopes, but some of them are still operating for various projects. This, however, is really the main uh, astrophysical telescope uh, being operated on the site at the moment. So I'll just show, I've, I've picked a gallery of some of my favorite uh, radio astronomy images to show uh, this particular one. This is actually a relatively old image uh, from the VLA in New Mexico of, a, of some gaseous jets uh, being emitted from a black hole uh, in Hercules A. Uh, I love this picture just because of, you can really get a sense of the, the flow of the gases and all these are being ejected from the, from the black hole, which is spinning, having powerful magnetic fields that ejects these jets at uh, relative, relativistic velocities. <clears throat> uh, this is another very uh, cool image to me. Uh, it's of a gravitationally lensed galaxy from the very distant universe, uh, which distorts the background galaxy into what we call an Einstein ring. Uh, one of the reasons I think this picture is so cool is because it shows how good a resolution imaging we can get using radio interference techniques. Uh, the blue haze that you see throughout most of, the, most of this picture is actually Hubble Space Telescope data of the foreground galaxy. And you can see that the Hubble 
telescope can barely resolve that galaxy as it is it's mostly a blur but the uh the uh lensed galaxy which is being detected by the alma telescope down in chile has this exquisite resolution of all these details that uh that you can see uh the, the two don't actually see the same thing because the the uh visible the foreground galaxy is in the visible light mostly and and uh, alma it hasn't been red shifted to the same degree that the background galaxy was. So the ALMA data is shown here in orange and red while the Hubble Space Telescope is shown in blue. And you can get a sense of the, of the exquisite kind of detail and, and scientific uh, uh, information we can get uh, from the ALMA telescope at its highest frequencies. Uh, this, this image was taken a few years ago, also with ALMA. It's one of, it, it made quite a splash in the astrophysics community. It's of a protoplanetary disk which is a forming star system around another star. Uh, the star itself is, is not this blob in the middle. It would actually be too small. It's a little dot in the middle. There's a, there's a lot of gas and dust surrounding it, which is mostly what you see here. But this, this entire uh, disk of swirling gas and dust is, is forming a, a star system. And what you can see, the, the dark rings are basically where there are planets forming and they're, and they're sweeping out the material in their orbits uh, as, they, as they coalesce. Uh, and like I say, this, this was really exciting when this image was made a couple of years ago, uh, largely because we'd never been able to see it in this kind of detail before. There had been artist conceptions, but this is the first time we actually imaged one. And on top of that, um, the astronomers were really surprised actually to see a star system this mature, this well formed, let's say, so early after the star itself had formed. And of course, I can't uh, not show this image, which was really one of the best images of all last year. This is the first ever picture of a black hole, uh, which was taken in, uh, in the galaxy, uh, from the galaxy uh, M87. Uh, this was actually a collaboration of a number of telescopes, including the ALMA telescope in Chile, as well as a number of other sub-millimeter wave telescopes um, throughout the Western Hemisphere. And what you're seeing here is, is the uh, material uh, very close to the event horizon swirling around it. And there's what they call the shadow in the middle uh, where, where no light can escape. Uh, the, the first comment we always get from people when we show this picture is, why is it so blurry? <laughs> and uh, the, I, I tell them it's 50 million light years away, so give us a break. <laughs> <clears throat> So I work with the electrical engineering uh, group at NRAO, specifically the Central Development Lab. Uh, that we, we actually have a lot of disciplines uh, at the observatory. We have engineers, electrical, digital engineers, computer scientists, mechanical engineers, physicists, chemists, all working together. That's one of the things I love about radio astronomy is it's a very uh, multidisciplinary uh, discipline. Um, what you're seeing in the background here is uh, the ALMA correlator, which is the supercomputer effectively that takes the data from all of the telescopes uh, in the array down in Chile and forms, does the image forming. And so it's a very high data rate uh, image processor, if you will. So there's a lot of digital hardware engineering that goes into that. We also do a lot of analog uh, work as well. Uh, these are some pictures of a special uh, uh, technical specialist in the lab where I work uh, building cryogenic amplifiers, excuse me, um, we do cryogenically cool our receivers, and that's that's essentially to reduce the noise. So we're, we're making low noise amplifiers, some of which are shown down here in the lower left panel. Uh, at performance, sort of ultimate performance for these amplifiers in terms of noise noise performance is about five times the quantum limit as a function of frequency, which essentially means we can we can detect a signal of only five photons hitting the dish. Um, but they're cryogenically cooled, typically to a temperature of about 15 to 20 Kelvin or 15 to 20 degrees above absolute zero. Um, so these are literally some of the most sensitive amplifiers in the world. Um, here on the lower right is a multi, just a close-up of some MIMIC chips and a multi-chip module that I designed as part of the uh, uncooled warm receiver electronics for one of our telescopes uh, a few years ago. Um, there's, I could go on all day about uh, NRAO, but I want to get to the technical part of the talk. So uh, if you want to learn more, I'd, I'd direct you to our website. Uh, we have a great website uh, with information for teachers and students, as well as general public, uh, just information about our telescopes and news and events that, that are going on uh, at various times. Uh, if you're interested in working with us, uh, like I say, it's a very multidisciplinary field, and we, uh, we always have uh, active postings on our Jobvite website. Uh, the address for which is which is here on the right. So we look forward to hearing from you. 
All right, so I'm going to dive into the uh, electrical engineering part of my talk. Um, and specifically, I'm going to talk about a technology that's near and dear to my heart called the uh, reflectionless filters. So I'm sure a lot of all of you know that a filter is a two port device uh, that uh, accepts certain frequencies or passes certain frequencies while rejecting others, what we call a pass band and stop band. Uh, what we don't think about very often is the fact that how does that rejection occur for, for a conventional filter stop band signal is, is, is rejected by reflection. In other words, if you try to put in a signal in the stop band or at a stop band frequency, it'll just reflect back out of the filter back towards the source. All a reflectionless filter is, is it, it has absorptive elements internally that allow that stop band energy to be absorbed inside the filter rather than reflected back. And so from a, from a microwave standpoint, it has zero reflection. From a circuit standpoint, essentially what that means is that you see a 50 ohm impedance when looking into either port at all frequencies, whether you're in the pass band or the stop band. So it's, it's a good impedance match uh, across all frequencies. Why do we care about that? Um, so typically in any, in any signal uh, path for, from any kind of receiver, and I'm just showing sort of a cartoon here of a typical kind of receiver, you're gonna have very wide band and nonlinear components that are part of your system. So mixers, for example, mixer is, is a, device, a frequency translation device. So typically you'll have uh, one frequency or tone coming in on the RF port and another uh, tone called the local oscillator on another port and the mixer multiplies those two. And so you get the sum or difference frequency out. And usually in the case of a receiver, we're down converting. So we take the difference frequency, but the mixer also generates the sum frequency and it also generates other mixing products or higher or sums and differences of higher order multiples of, of the LO and RF inputs. And we call these undesired mixing products spurs. And so the mixer will generate these spurs that, that emit from its ports, uh, typically where it will find a filter and that filter will reject those spurs because they're out of band. And so what happens to those spurs, what happens to the energy from those spurs is they reflect right back into the mixer where they mix again and generate more spurs. And so there's this proliferation of spurious mixing products such that if you tried to characterize a mixer on the lab bench, as is typically done by, by vendors of these kinds of parts, you know, you're gonna, on the lab bench, you're gonna put nice 50 ohm terminations on all of its ports you're gonna characterize what its spurious response is and you're gonna publish that in your data sheet. But then you drop that mixer into an actual system with terminations on all the ports that are not necessarily 50 ohms and, and your spurious response is gonna be very different. Uh, so that's one problem with conventional filters. Additionally, uh, components like amplifiers have very broadband response. You know, you wanna filter that response, but the gain doesn't roll off out of band as quickly as you might like. And so that out of band uh, information again, hits this filter, which is designed to limit your frequency range. And the, the out of band energy, it doesn't, it doesn't get, have anywhere to go. It literally gets trapped. And so you build up these standing waves out of band. And that can, you know, if it's severe enough, you can have uh, some negative effects, uh, some non-linearity dynamic range issues with the amplifier. It could even self bias a little bit. I've had that happen. Uh, and so when you're designing very, very sensitive, very precise kind of receivers, like we do in radio astronomy all the time, uh, this kind of out-of-band interaction between these components is, is undesirable. Uh, the same kind of thing happens with harmonic multipliers. Uh, when you're generating like a multiple of the LO, for example, there's the desired harmonic comes out and the undesired harmonics come out as well, which are then uh, rejected by the filter and you get these standing waves. And that's partly responsible for the characteristic uh, frequency structure that you often see in multiplier chains. You usually don't get a nice flat conversion efficiency, but it gets a lot of ripple and, and peaks and valleys as a consequence in part uh, from these standing waves. Um, another somewhat lesser uh, uh, known problem, uh, ADCs, uh, you know, in the input stage of an ADC, you might have a buffer, but you, you also will have track and hold stages that switch uh, on and off as, as you're sampling the signal and those switching, that switching action can create transient uh, pulses that are emitted backward from the ADC and those pulses will contain, will contain frequency information out beyond the, the intended baseband range of your receiver, where you typically will have an anti-aliasing filter that will reflect part of those pulses back into the ADC where you get uh, where it affects your spur-free dynamic range. So if we replace these filters with the absorptive kind or the reflectionless kind, uh, a lot of these problems are, are mitigated. The uh, spurs produced by the mixer, which you do still get some spurious response, but they don't, they don't remix and remix and remix. So they don't proliferate quite as bad. 
Um, and likewise, these out-of-band uh, signals from the uh, amplifier and multipliers, uh, if they're out-of-band, they just get absorbed by the filter. They don't, they don't bounce back and create standing waves. And likewise, the uh, switching transients from the ADC, which it still generates, but they're just absorbed harmlessly in the filter instead of being redirected back into the ADC. So this helps uh, mitigate a lot of these problems associated with out-of-band interactions between components. So how does it work? Um, <clears throat> So just as just to review for those who may not have seen it in a while, uh, we typically talk about filters. We we characterize their their responses in terms of some canonically optimal responses. A lot of us have heard about the Chebyshev type or Butterworth type filters. The Chebyshev filters are those that have the equal ripples uh, amplitudes. Uh, typically, when we just say Chebyshev filter, what we really mean is Chebyshev type one, where the ripples are in the pass band. There's another kind called a Chebyshev type two where you have equal ripples in the stop band and it's monotonic in the pass band. This is also called an inverse Chebyshev type filter. Uh, this is kind of important because a lot of the reflectionless, the, the, especially the easier reflectionless filters are of this type. Um, there's also the Butterworth or maximally flat type filters. Uh, there's elliptic filters, which I'm not showing you here, but we can do those in a reflectionless form as well, although it's fairly complicated. And then there's a, again, lesser known uh, a response known as a Legendre type filter, which is also monotonic uh, and a little sharper than the Butterworth, but not quite as flat in the pass band. All of these can be done in reflectionless uh, topologies. Um, so let's talk topology for a little bit. <clears throat> the most common topology for a lumped element filter, a uh, conventional type of filter, is what we call a ladder topology or a Cower topology after uh, Wilhelm Cower. Uh, and in the case of a low pass filter, it comprises series inductors uh, and shunt capacitors with certain values that you can calculate. And if you pick those values correctly, you'll get a low pass frequency response like this, which is a Chebyshev type one filter where you have these equal ripples in the pass band. And your reflection coefficient sort of tracks, you have ripples in the reflection and then out of band, the reflection coefficient is asymptotically zero dB. So it's like 100% reflection where I like to think of it as maximally poor impedance match uh, out of band. I'm going to work uh, largely with normalized quantities. This is going to be kind of a theoretical, circuit theoretical talk. And so I'm going to divide out impedance and I'm going to divide out the frequency uh, so that you end up with these dimensionless quantities uh, describing the element values G1, G2, G3, G4. These are literally the parameters you would look up in a textbook. If you look up a table, for a prototype parameter table for a Chebyshev or a Butterworth filter, and they'll they'll list these G1, G2, G3 numbers. That's what they are. They're just they're just the inductance and capacitance values uh, normalized out for frequency and impedance. Um, and you can plot it, and you get it. This is exactly the same curve. It's just that we've changed the uh, x-axis now from uh, gigahertz to having a corner frequency of one radian per second. But it's it's basically the same thing. But of course, that's a conventional filter topology. What I want to do is, is derive a topology that doesn't have this uh, zero dB reflection out of band. So it's kind of an interesting thought experiment. I started out with just sort of a black box and I said, okay, I'm going to make it a couple of assumptions. First assumption I'm going to make is that this is a symmetric two port circuit. And I wanted it to be symmetric because I wanted it to be reflectionless from both sides. Uh, and I should point out that the classical topologies typically are symmetric uh, in a seventh order design like this, for example, G1 equals G7, G2 equals G6, most of the time for most uh, filter responses like the Chebyshev response. So I'm going to assume this is a symmetric two-port network. And what that allows me to do is it allows me to analyze the performance of the circuit using a technique we call even and odd mode analysis. So what I'll do is I'll draw, draw a symmetry plane down the center of the circuit and just again as a thought experiment, I can imagine cutting that circuit in half and pulling it apart, exposing some wires in the middle. And so what I'm left with is two identical half circuits with half the elements on each side and some nodes or some wires in the middle. I can analyze the behavior of this circuit by using two different uh, excitations. And the first one we call the even mode excitation, which is when we drive both ports simultaneously with the same signal uh, in phase. And because of the symmetry properties of this of this thing, as I've set it up, we can be assured that under this excitation, there is no current flowing left or right in these wires because there would be no way to tell which the direction would be indeterminate. We wouldn't know which direction the current would have to flow. So we know that I has to be equal zero on all of these wires. And because of that, I can cut them 
and just leave them open circuited. And then we we're left with half the elements in what we call the even mode equivalent circuit. Likewise, I can use a different excitation called the odd mode where I drive both ports uh, with identical signals 180 degrees out of phase with each other. And under these conditions, because of the symmetry of the design, uh, I know that there's no voltage on these wires with respect to ground because the voltage of these that would be on these wires would also be indeterminate. There'd be no way to tell which polarity it would have. Is it a positive or a negative voltage? <clears throat> so in this case, again, I can throw away half the elements and I can tie these wires to a virtual ground. And this is what I call the odd mode equivalent circuit. So I can analyze the behavior of my symmetric two port network by its response uh, to these two, to the even mode and the odd mode stimulus <clears throat> or the even and odd mode equivalent circuits. And it turns out that the reflection coefficient of my two port network is just the average of the even and odd mode reflection coefficients of the half port network, half networks. <clears throat> and then the uh, transmission coefficient of my two port is just gonna be uh, half the difference between the two. So if I wanna make a reflectionless filter, then I'm gonna prescribe the condition that gamma, the reflection coefficient of the two port network is identically zero. And then, and then also that the transmission coefficient is just some uh, filter response function that I want. So this is not hard math. I can solve uh, this equation and determine that, okay, th in order for that to be true, I must have gamma even equal to negative gamma odd. Um, and then if I plug that condition back in here, then I just find that the transmission response of my filter is given by gamma even. Um, this first condition is what we're gonna call duality. Um, in other words, the even and odd mode equivalent circuits must be duals of each other. That effectively means that their reflection coefficients are negated. Um, the second condition is really a, a high pass transformation or a frequency inversion. Because if you think about it, if I wanna make a low pass filter, then I want my transmission response here to be high. I want it to pass low frequencies. Then that means my even mode equivalent circuit must reflect low frequencies, which is what you get from a terminated high pass filter. So this, this condition is kind of a frequency inversion. This condition in blue is, is duality. So a little bit more about duality. Again, I just say the even and odd mode reflection coefficients are negatives of each other. Uh, for those of you who have studied microwaves, uh, you, can, you can plug in the formula uh, for reflection coefficient in terms of impedance, in term, and particularly in terms of a characteristic impedance of the source, uh, Z naught. Um, and I just put those numbers in here. This side is negated because gamma odd is negative. Um, again, I'm gonna be working largely with normalized values. So I'm gonna divide through by Z naught and then use a lowercase uh, Z E to represent the normalized even mode impedance. And then Z O for the normalized even mode uh, or odd mode impedance. Uh, I'll convert the right hand side to admittance. So I use Y naught or I'm sorry, Y O for the normalized odd mode admittance. And I have, you can see I have the same formula here. So it boils down to a relatively simple relationship. The normalized even mode impedance must be equal to the normalized odd mode admittance. And that essentially is the duality condition that says that my even and odd mode circuits are duals of one another. So how does that work? <clears throat> I'm gonna try and design a filter now that meets all of these conditions in order to be reflectionless. So remember I said that there was sort of this frequency inversion. So I'm gonna try and design a low pass prototype filter <clears throat> and because of the frequency inversion, that means I'm going to put a high pass prototype filter in my even mode circuit. And I'm just going to start with a, a third order uh, ladder topology here. So I have series capacitors, shunt, a shunt inductor, and then a termination. So that basically prescribes my frequency response of my filter. But then I need to construct the dual of that circuit on the odd mode side. And remember I said the dual essentially inverts the impedance, right? So I'm gonna replace series elements with shunt elements, and I'm gonna replace shunt elements with series elements, capacitors with inductors, and inductors with capacitors. So when I draw my odd mode equivalent circuit, <clears throat> it's gonna look again like a ladder network, but you can see I've replaced this series capacitor with this shunt inductor, and, and I haven't labeled their values yet, I'm gonna talk about that later, but they have to have normalized uh, equivalent values. And each, each element has sort of been, been replaced one by one. So I've, I've guaranteed now that I, I have the low pass response that I want because of, the, because of the response that I chose for the even mode equivalent circuit. 
I've guaranteed that it's reflectionless because I've, I've satisfied the duality condition where the even mode admittance and the odd mode impedance are inverses of one another. What I haven't done is, is satisfied my initial assumption, which is that these were gonna be two halves of a symmetric network. <clears throat> so what I'm gonna do next is I wanna make modifications to these even and odd mode equivalent circuits that preserve their behavior, preserve their electrical response, but such that they look like symmetric part, two, 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 even, two equal parts of a symmetric circuit. It sounds pretty daunting, but the trick I'm gonna use is the fact that the even mode equivalent circuit, the symmetry plane on the even mode equivalent circuit side is an open circuit, is, a, is, a, is an open circuit condition as I showed earlier, whereas the symmetry plane on the odd mode equivalent circuit side is given by a virtual short. So you'll notice if I start here at the top, uh, my, my, on my even mode side, my first element is a series capacitor, whereas on the odd mode side, my first element is a shunt inductor. I can actually put a shunt inductor over here by connecting an inductor from this node to the symmetry plane. And I'm allowed to do that because the symmetry plane, as we said, is an open circuit on the even mode side. So adding this inductor is just floating. It doesn't change the behavior of this side at all. Likewise, this inductor, which is connected to a ground, I can change its ground from what I call an absolute ground to a virtual ground. So I can, again, on the odd mode side, the symmetry plane is a, is a short circuit or an equivalent or a virtual short circuit. So I can change the grounding of this inductor from absolute to virtual. So that doesn't change its behavior either. So I'm looking pretty good. Now I have on both sides, I have a shunt inductor, a series capacitor, a shunt inductor, but then I run into trouble. My next element on this side is a capacitor, whereas my next element on this side is a resistor. But the next thing I see is that this capacitor and this resistor are in series with each other. So I can exchange their positions without, without again affecting its result, without affecting its performance. <clears throat> so I'm getting closer. This resistor is grounded, but as we've shown before, I can change this ground from absolute to virtual by connecting it to the symmetry plane, which is a short, virtual short circuit on the odd mode side. Then on the even mode side, I can connect this node to the open circuit symmetry plane. And then my last step, I'm gonna add a capacitor here. And the reason I can do that is because this capacitor is shorted at both ends. It's got a virtual short on this node and an absolute short on this node. So adding that capacitor doesn't change its behavior. So just to re recap, all of the steps that I just took, essentially, um, preserved these dual behaviors, but drew, redrew them in such a way that they look symmetric. I had a floating inductor on the even mode side. I changed the grounding of the inductor on the odd mode side from absolute to virtual. I reversed the order of these series elements down here. I changed the grounding of the resistor on the right from absolute to virtual. I draw a floating wire on the left side, and then I draw a double shorted capacitor on the right side. So the, the du dual behaviors have been preserved, but now it's symmetric. So I can put them back together now and I've completed essentially my uh, reflectionless filter network. Um, I haven't talked about values yet, so I'm gonna talk about that real quick. Um, <clears throat> again, in normalized quantities, let me just assume that this capacitor has value X uh, down here. Obviously by symmetry, that means this one also has to be X. But because of the duality condition that I talked about, remember this capacitor is associated with this inductor via its, its response in terms of dual impedances. So the normalized value of this inductor must also be X, okay? And then by symmetry, that has to be X, and by duality, that has to be X, and symmetry and duality, and then symmetry. So eventually you see that the entire network has to have, all these elements have to have the same, all the reactive elements anyway, have to have the same normalized value. So I can put in any value I want. Uh, again, just for theoretical experimentation, I'm just gonna put in one, normalized value of one. And this is the response I get. It's actually not too bad. It's a low pass response as I as targeted. Uh, it's a third order, uh, in point of fact, it's a third order Chebyshev type two filter with a stop band uh, peak at about 14 and a half dB. But the good news is you can plug this into your simulator if you like, scale these, uh, these for impedance and frequency, however you like, but then you're gonna end up with nothing but a dot in the middle of the Smith chart. It, it truly is reflectionless at all frequencies. Which I personally found nothing, not, no short of, nothing less than remarkable when I first figured this out. Um, the unfortunate thing is because of the way the element values are all linked to one another, I can't really tune this response very well. I can tune it in frequency by, by changing uh, these 
by scaling all of these values together. And I can tune it for different impedances, but it's always going to have exactly this response and exactly this much, this value at the peak. Um, I could have used, now again, if you remember, I started with a third order prototype in my uh, even weight equivalent circuit. I could have started with a higher order ladder prototype, uh, such as this. I would have ended up with a fifth order filter. I'd get this response, or I could have used a seventh order filter and I would have gotten this response. But unfortunately, begin because again, because I'm limited in the values I can choose here, I can't really tune this response. And these higher order responses are really not that useful as filters because we have these high stop band peaks. Uh, even the fifth order design, it's, its first side lobe, if you will, is at like 4 dB, which is pretty useless as a filter. So this was really the only thing I could do for the longest period of time. This, is, this, this particular level of rejection is, is kind of mediocre and I got deeper rejection levels just by cascading them. Since they're matched, they cascade pretty well. So you get you just get uh, cumulative uh, attenuation in the stop band that way. But I had to figure out a better way to do higher order filters. So I eventually figured out how to do that using a technique I call subnetwork expansion. So uh, here again is my third order topology. I'm gonna redraw it a little bit before I do the next step. So I just wanna show you uh, all of these ground nodes. I'm gonna gather those up together into one point in the middle. Um, also, you notice I've got like two series elements up here. There's no reason to have two inductors. I can combine them into one. It just turned out that way because of the way I was drawing the even, the symmetric circuit and putting it together. So I can combine those two inductors together. And then uh, for convenience in that next step, I'm just going to move these resistors here down to the bottom uh, where they're a little more accessible. So what I what I realized is these these resistors essentially just terminate the stop band energy, right? So any in, any input that you put through this port that's in the stop band of the filter gets absorbed in these resistors. So I can take out those resistors and just replace them more generically with a termination. And that termination can in fact be a port if you think about it. Any, anything I want to attach here, as long as it's impedance matched, it'll act like a termination and it'll it will absorb uh, that stop band energy. Okay, um, those of you may have studied uh, signal flow graphs. This is what the signal flow graph uh, for this structure looks like, uh, where A1, for example, is the amplitude of the input wave going into port one, and then B1 is the amplitude of the outgoing wave at port one, okay? And I have certain coupling coefficients, say from port one to port two, that's given by H, and another coefficient, and these are, you know, these can be whatever function you want, depending on how you design, assign the values, but, but uh, uh, P basically gives the gain from port one down to port three, and vice versa, because of the symmetry, these, these repeat in various places. But the reflectionless condition is essentially the fact that A1 and B1, or the ingoing and outgoing wave amplitudes at port one, are essentially not even connected uh, in the signal flow graph. They're independent of each other. And that essentially is the reflectionless condition. So, like I said, I can put any termination I want here on these ports. I can even put a two-port network connecting the two, as long as it's matched. So I can imagine attaching a two-port network here from port three to port four. Uh, let's say that that network has a gain of A, which I've added to the signal flow graphs over here. But you'll notice, as long as this, as long as we assume this subnetwork is matched, <clears throat> there's still no connection between the input amplitude at port one and the output amplitude at port one. So it's still a reflectionless circuit as long as this two port network is matched. So uh, I thought, I'm like, well, what can I attach here? What kind of matched subnetworks can I think of? Uh, first thing I tried was an attenuator actually. You can actually get some interesting responses that way. But then of course it dawned on me, I know the perfect matched two port network to put here. It's called a reflectionless filter. <laughs> so what I did is I essentially embedded one reflectionless filter inside another reflectionless filter inside another reflectionless filter and I just terminate the chain that way and I get this new topology and if I plug in uh, sort of separate uh, tunings let's say for each of the three sub filters uh, x y and z uh, and in this case I just choose to tune them all the same you get this response here so it is a higher order it's a seventh order response so it has a fairly sharp cutoff uh, again, just because of the constraints over here, I don't have total freedom in, in, in how these uh, uh, peaks in the stop band are, are, are working, but I do get about a good octave stop band. Um, so I'm getting better and it's still totally reflectionless. 
but actually it's over constrained. Again, I kind of derived this by thinking about embedding networks inside of networks and I, and I wanted each sub network to be independently impedance matched. It's actually a little bit uh, over constrained. You can actually have your parent network, if you will, mismatched and your sub network or your child network mismatched, but in a way that they compensate each other so that the, the ensemble is totally matched. And if you go back and you analyze the symmetry and the duality conditions like I did at the beginning, it turns out you can generalize uh, these element values more than this. And now I'm back to quoting uh, the uh, prototype parameter values, which you can go look up again in tables or there's equations for this in many textbooks. And that allows me to even up the stop band peaks. And so now I'm getting a little better. Now I'm back to a sort of an optimized Chebyshev type two filter response, totally reflectionless. Um, Again, study this a little more and you realize there's kind of a pattern here in terms of the uh, the layout of the inductors and the capacitors. And if you look at it like this, this uh, chain of capacitors up the middle, I'm actually missing one uh, at the top and then I'm missing an inductor at the bottom, which I can go ahead and add. <clears throat> and that actually frees up some of the conditions that I had. Yeah, I think I, I, think I forgot, whoops, sorry, I forgot to say that. One of the conditions in order to meet the duality constraints of this network was that G1 had to equal G2 and G6 equals G7. That essentially limited this, this uh, ripple uh, amplitude to a certain value uh, to meet that condition. But by generalizing the topologies in this way, I sort of free up that condition and that allows me to have a variable uh, ripple amplitude uh, in, in my response. So at this point, you really can go and look up uh, prototype parameters tab tabulated in many textbooks. There is one problem though, and that is if you look at the uh, pr prototype parameter values, G1, G2 through, through G7, for a Chebyshev type filter as a function of its ripple amplitude, which in this case is the stop band rejection level uh, shown here, there's a certain point where, where the G1 and the G2 values uh, cross over, right? One becomes larger than the other. And because of that, and that happens at about the stop band level here of about 13 and a half dB, as you can see down here, and it happens symmetrically for G6 and G7 as well on the other side. But as a consequence of that, if I try to make the ripples any smaller than this, um, then these, this value I've calculated here, uh, which again was required by the duality condition uh, that I need to make this a reflectionless filter where I have G1 minus G2, that subtraction turns out negative. And so I would need a negative valued capacitor here in order to make this work. And then, and likewise, I'd need a negative valued inductor here to make this work. So I had this limit in terms of the uh, ripple factor or the uh, stop band rejection that I could get using this topology. I eventually figured out a way around that though as well, uh, which is kind of interesting. Uh, if you study this circuit, you'll see that there's really three inductors here as part of a group. And you'll notice the, the subtracted uh, parameter G6 is repeated up here in the two series elements, uh, G6. So I have two positive inductors and then one negative inductor in sort of a pi network. And it turns out there's actually an equivalent circuit for this that has the same electrical response or an identity, a circuit identity, if you will, that has the same electrical response, but with all positive elements that looks effectively like this. It's just three inductors with a current inverting transformer, a uh, one-to-one -one current inverting transformer. So that allows me to get rid of this uh, negative element here in the middle. So I put that back in my circuit and I've eliminated uh, my negative inductor where I used to have G7 minus G6. Now I have G6 minus G7. So I've, I've inverted the subtraction. Um, <clears throat> I still have a problem up here with the capacitors. Uh, this is a little bit different, a uh, little, little more tricky because these capacitors are not even connected to each other. So it's not like I can pull out a very simple subnetwork replace it with an identity and then and put it back in. I have to man do some manipulation of the topology first. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna put my hand over the bottom half of the circuit, okay? And just ignore that for the moment. Do note one thing, however, and that is that um, there's no ground node in the lower half of the circuit. The only ground connection in this entire circuit is right here. So when I cover this up, I'll give myself just a little room to work. Because there's no ground sink down here in the circuit, I know that the currents flowing in these outer branches eventually have to return through this middle branch. They, you know, they, the IA from the left branch here and IB from the right branch, they can circulate inside this subnetwork all they want, but eventually they have to return 
through the center path to ground. So I have uh, this, the current in the center path here has to be the sum of the outer two currents. And there's another way it turns out to enforce that condition, and that is I can put a couple of transformers, like so, again, just assuming one-to-one -one transformers, so that the current uh, passing through this capacitor, one over G2, is effectively mirrored on this side and passes up through the center branch. And likewise, any current here, or IB, passing through this capacitor, one over G2, is mirrored by the transformer and passes through this side. So I've sort of held that condition where these, these currents have to return that way. Um, but now that I have this transformer here, I can hold that while I move this capacitor from this side of the transformer to this side, and likewise from this capacitor here to the middle like that. Um, and I've, I've done this in such a way that I haven't actually changed the behavior of the circuit. But now I have my T network of two positive inductors with a negative inductor, I'm sorry, two positive capacitors with a negative capacitor. Uh, which has an equivalent circuit, once again, that, that is all positive uh, with a current inverting transformer. So I can put that back into my circuit, <clears throat> and it looks like that. And again, I've inverted the subtraction, so I've eliminated my negative elements. Um, I'm a little embarrassed to say that I actually published this topology before I realized that uh, all of these transformers up here are kind of redundant. I'm really just mirroring currents and copying currents from different branches of the circuit. Um, I had to do it that way conceptually, like I just showed you, so that I could figure out how to change the change the topology. But once it's done, really these transformers are kind of redundant. You can get rid of two of them, and just one transformer will do, uh, like like shown. And you're left with a positive capacitor in its place. So the good thing about that, again, is I've essentially eliminated my negative elements, and it's allowed me to push my uh, ripple amplitude much deeper. Um, you still hit a limit in this case, about 35 dB. Where the next pair, this subtraction G3 minus G4 goes negative, and this subtraction G5 minus G4 goes negative. But again, if I if I really wanted to go any deeper than this in rejection, I could in fact use the same trick and substitute these same equivalents back into the circuit uh, to to make it work, and I wouldn't have to have any negative elements. And throughout all of this, given given ideal components, which is a big big given, um, you still have a perfectly reflectionless uh, circuit. And again. Uh, I encourage you to go plug this into your circuit simulator if you have one. It's a lot of fun and interesting to, to see this kind of a filter response drop out of, of, of a circuit like this. So I'm usually just going to draw this filter, uh, you know, without the transformers because it's simpler and you can kind of recognize the pattern easier. But realize that at any point, if you have a negative element, it always works out. You can plug in these, these equivalent circuit identities and get rid of it. So I just kind of use this symbolically as my representation of, of a reflectionless, a general reflectionless filter, in this case, a seventh order design. Uh, like any lumped element filter, I can, I can apply a frequency transformation. Uh, so if you know, I had a low pass uh, fil filter prototype, let's say I wanted a high pass filter. There's, again, this is well understood uh, in textbooks, uh, you end up, you just uh, re, you convert the inductors to capacitors and the capacitors to inductors. And their values are, the normalized values are inverses of each other. So this inductor having value two over G1 just becomes a capacitor with value G1 over two and so on. And if I do that, I get this high pass uh, type of filter response. Again, totally reflectionless. <clears throat> um, but the other thing, so the next thing I'm gonna think about is, notice I've been doing all Chebyshev type two filters where you have the stop band ripple. Um, Remember that the stop band energy put into this port on the left side gets terminated in this uh, resistor. Um, <clears throat> but there's really no reason I have to just terminate this with the resistor. I can actually couple it out as a port. And instead, I can terminate this one with a resistor. So if I do that, I swap those elements, then I actually get the low pass equivalent response out of from this port to this port and it's a Chebyshev type one filter. And again, totally reflectionless. And I just, I've just left the dotted line here as the residual, just that that was the response I had with the high pass filter. It's not actually the reflection coefficient. The reflection coefficient is identically zero uh, given ideal elements. But I want you to kind of see the relationship between the type one uh, low pass response and the type two high pass response. That it turns out the Chebyshev type one and Chebyshev type two filters are duals of each other. And you can actually you can see that in a lot of filters. Uh, elliptic filters are their own tools with different ripple factors. Uh, Butterworth filter is its own tool as well, and so on. 
Um, so practical Im implementations, uh, I'll go back and say this, this precise high pass filter is implemented in a planar uh, monolithic integrated circuit like this. Um, we actually make these on uh, gallium arsenide in a passive only, what they call an integrated passive device process where we use on-chip uh, MIM or metal insulator metal stack up uh, capacitors, um, as well as these on-chip planar spiral inductors. Uh, we have vias for the ground connection, usually the back side of the chip is ground. And then we have these on-chip thin film resistors for absorbing uh, the stop band energy. Um, and I'm very happy to say we've actually licensed this technology now to uh, many circuits uh, who's marketing them. Uh, you can go and buy them. This is, this is one of those high pass filters. So again, I've been throughout much of the theoretical part of this talk, I've been showing um, ideal element uh, responses. Obviously in real life, uh, the responses are not perfectly ideal and you do get some parasitic effects. Uh, so the reflection coefficient, for example, is not really infinity, unfortunately, um, but we usually, we can still get pretty close to 20 dB for most frequency ranges. Uh, we've gotten honestly a little better at it since this particular model was made. Um, but you can see, again, keep in mind that a conventional filter, this S11, this return loss curve, would be close to zero dB uh, out in the stop band. And here we're, we're still seeing a good impedance match. Um, this is what this is a picture of an actual uh, uh, filter. Uh, this is not my finger, by the way. This is my lab technician, a guy named Todd Boyd, who works with me, a great guy. Uh, we, we let him uh, take the picture partly because he has a much steadier hand than I do. <laughs> And also because he's got very good big hands, so it makes the uh, chip look look smaller, which is more impressive. So this was a good uh, PR photo. But uh, this is what the chip actually looks like. This is actually a, a third order bandpass filter uh, you're seeing here. Uh, you can get them from many circuits in both uh, chip form as well as packaged uh, in these uh, surface mount uh, QFN, usually a three, four or five millimeter surface mount package. This is great for me. I, I designed these filters originally for radio astronomy. I was trying to resolve some of those issues with the receivers that I was showing you at the very beginning, uh, I, was, I was trying to make very sensitive radio astronomy receivers, and I was having some issues associated with out-of-band impedance uh, mismatch. And so I developed these filters for that purpose, but at first it was very hard for me to make because uh, to get chips like this made, I have to pay for an entire wafer run, and it's very expensive. Um, I now kind of suffer the indignity of having to buy my own filters from a commercial company, uh, many circuits, but uh, I'm very happy to be able to do it actually because uh, I can get them a lot cheaper in, in just the quantities I need that way. Um, when I do uh, new prototypes, when I come up with new topologies, uh, I typically prototype them initially using just circuit boards at relatively low frequency. And I've shown a couple of these here from a paper that I published uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, this particular one is one of these deep rejection uh, Chebyshev type filters. It has the transformers in it to, to mitigate the negative elements. This was sort of the first proof that that works. And I took that sort of to an extreme where you, where you push the uh, ripple amplitude all the way down to zero. And effectively then a Chebyshev filter becomes a Butterworth filter uh, with lots of transformers in it. And you get this nice Butterworth response uh, as well as the uh, smooth group delay that's uh, highly prized uh, for the Butterworth type filters. Um, obviously, you know, in reality, the, in theory, the, the rejection would just keep monotonically decreasing all the way down to infinity. In reality, it bottoms out here at about 60 dB as a consequence of uh, crosstalk and leakage between these elements. All right, uh, so I think we have a little bit of time. I'm going to go through the uh, transmission line derivations just to show you this is not limited only to lumped element circuits, but you can do it with transmission lines as well. I'm going to start with a very simple uh, prototype, in this case, a two-element uh, ladder with just a one pair of inductor and capacitor. Um, to make this uh, transmission line circuit, I apply what we call Richards transformation, which some of you may have learned about, where whoops, sorry, um, the shunt capacitor is replaced with a parallel connected open circuited stub, transmission line stub, and the series inductor was replaced with a short circuit. I'm sorry, a series connected short circuited stub. Um, the next thing I'm going to do is add a port extension, which is just a cascade transmission line. It can be a 50 ohm line or it doesn't have to be. It can be another impedance altogether, but I can do that without uh, hurting things too much. Still is going to have the, uh, the frequency response that I want. Then I have to construct the dual, if you remember how that works. So the dual in the transmission line case uh, the cascade line is replaced with a cascade line having the inverse and characteristic impedance. 
um, my parallel open circuited stub is replaced with a series connected short circuited stub and my series connected short circuited stub is, con is replaced with a parallel open circuited stub and that's how I get the inverse impedance on the odd mode side that characterizes my dual. Uh, next, I'm gonna apply Kuroda's identity. So step back for a little bit, which changes this series stub to an open stub on the other side of my transmission line. <clears throat> but now I have to restore the symmetry like I did before with the lumped element designs. I have two, two circuits that behave the way I want, but I want them to look symmetric to each other. So, uh, let's see if I remember this. Yeah. So, the um, notice that this series stub and this resistor are just in series with each other. So, just like I did before with the lumped elements, I can exchange their order. Um, and when you connect this series connected stub to ground, because it's at the end of the chain, it doesn't really, there's no real difference between a series stub and a parallel stub. They both look the same. So, this just becomes a resistor with a short circuited stub at the end of it. Uh, again, I can change this capacitor, I'm sorry, this resistor, which is, has an absolute ground. Oops, sorry, did the alt I forgot the sequence of this. I haven't done these slides in a while. Um, this node, I can connect to an open circuit uh, symmetry plane. Then I think this ground goes from absolute to virtual. <clears throat> and then I'm gonna connect a stub here, which again, I'm allowed to do because it's short circuited here, it's short circuited here. So this, this line is just short circuited at both ends. So that's an addition I can make as well. And then up here, I have this shunt, uh, parallel connected open circuited stub, uh, but I don't have one here. So what I'm gonna do is change the connection. This one has an implicit ground connection. When I draw it this way, you don't see the ground, but it's actually there implicitly. I'm gonna change that ground from absolute to virtual so that it becomes a series connected open stub connected to the symmetry plane. And then I can add the similar one over here, which doesn't hurt because again, the symmetry plane is an open circuit on the even mode side. Oops. So I have a symmetric structure. The, the problem is that um, we don't like to, we tend not to like to have series stubs in our transmission line designs. If you're going to do this in microstrip, for example, it's very difficult to do a series connected stub. We'd like to make it parallel. So to do that, I'm going to look at my transmission line identities. Uh, there's a fairly well known identity, such as this, uh, where you have an open circuited uh, series stub with a cascade line and a, just an impedance transformation that equates to this coupled line network. What's less, not so well known, is that you can actually attach a third port uh, to this node here, and it's still entirely equivalent to the coupled line uh, circuit shown on this side, where the third port is just connected to this through line on this side. So I can apply this, and, and you can prove this identity mathematically just using impedance parameters uh, for transmission lines. Um, so I can apply this to my network here by adding a pair of transformers back to back that just sort of cancel each other out. And now I have the equivalent circuit for that coupled line network that I was showing earlier that I can make the substitution. And the circuit I end up with looks like this. Um, and actually you can do it a couple of different ways depending on, on whether you use this line as your cascade line or you put a port extension on the, on the external ports. Either way, you end up with coupled lines at the top. I'm not gonna bother, but you can go through the math and, and satisfy symmetry and duality to assign values to the, all of these impedances of all these lines. You get these, uh, these equations that basically, basically parameterize on the impedance of the cascade line X. And that parameter essentially gives you a bandwidth control as well as uh, to some extent the uh, stop band uh, level. But it's a bandpass filter that's in a, totally in transmission lines and still totally reflectionless. So that just kind of shows you that uh, we can do transmission line as well as lumped element designs. We haven't actually built many of these yet. Uh, I've done a couple of prototypes. I'm working on uh, working with many circuits, as it turns out, to uh, to implement some of these as well for higher frequency uh, circuits than we've done before. Um, I think that pretty much is my talk. Uh, here's some additional uh, references if 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 you all are interested in reading more about this. Um, and at that point, I guess I will uh, just open it back up for questions, if anybody has any. Yeah, so uh, thank you so much, Dr. Matthew. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Bishwajit, are you there? Mr. Bishwajit? Yes, sir, I'm here. Okay, so uh, I will just... Uh, there are questions in the question pan, question box. I will request you to read out the questions, moderate the questions and kindly read out so that Dr. Matthew can answer. 
Mr. Bishwajit is the currently the chairman of the student branch of IA, this IEEE of UM Jaipur. So uh, he will be reading out the questions which which uh, have which are there in the panel. Uh, okay, so there are a few questions. The first question is from Mr. Vishal Kumar Pandey. Uh, it is it possible to control the ripples using fractional order filters? Fractional order filters. Um, I'm not entirely sure what you, what you mean by that. Uh, all of the filters I've shown are odd order filters. Um, you can actually do even order filters. Um, uh, that uh, gets into using some of these uh, negative element mitigations as well in order to satisfy the symmetry and odd order uh, uh, in, in duality conditions. Um, I haven't honestly studied the uh, odd or, or fractional order filters all that much. I'd have to I'd have to go in and uh, try plugging in those parameter values. Essentially, this essentially what this boils down to is um, a ladder network, right? So if you take your take that topology I derived and you divide it down the middle and you draw the even mode equivalent circuit and you draw the odd mode equivalent circuit and you apply all the short and open circuit conditions and you combine parallel elements and series elements, what you end up with is a, is a basic ladder on both sides, a ladder topology on both sides. So you can plug in whatever parameter response, you whatever prototype parameters you want to that, as long as you can satisfy the duality condition. I've done it with, uh, like I say, Chebyshev is kind of the most popular. I've done Butterworth. Uh, I showed the Legendre type response, uh, which was an interesting one. You can actually make that work as well. Um, but I personally have not experimented with uh, fractional order filters. I'd have to do some research about that. Sorry. <laughs> so there is some problem with the, uh, with the, Mr. Bishwajit has got some power cut in the, in his place so i will just carry carry on with the questions okay. uh, dr matthew the next question comes from uh, vishal pandey also there is a second question from him uh, mm -hmm. he asks is it possible to control the ripples using fractional order filters uh that was the question i think he just asked um which i think okay. i just answered okay so uh, in case of mutual inductance effect how can we compensate in equivalent circuit? I think that is the question, second question. So yes, actually that is something I've looked at along with a, a um, co-author of mine for one of my papers. I don't know if I have it listed here. No, I didn't. Uh, yeah, uh, Mr. Uh, Willibert up here, we looked at that a bit. So you'll notice that, um, let's see, go back a little bit here. When you substitute in this uh, equivalent uh, transformer network here, um, you 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 have an you have a transformer with inductors on it, um, and so sometimes uh, you're if I understand your correct correction correctly, uh, you can use coupled inductors rather than an actual transformer, uh, in which case the coupling uh, coefficient is not 100%. You end up with some residual uh, inductance, which can be absorbed into these elements actually, and so uh, it is possible. Uh, to do that and, and get sort of a more ideal response than you could get uh, with the with the network as it's actually shown. That doesn't work quite so easily up here uh, with the capacitor because there's no nearby inductors that are that you can use to appropriately absorb that kind of thing. So, like a lot of things, it's, you can sort of compensate for it um, partially, but not not 100%. Um, one of the things about these filters, it's a little more difficult. It, it it's you're trying to control two things at once. You're trying to control your transmission response. You wanna maintain that nice filter response at the same time as you're trying to control the impedance uh, that, that is seen at the port so you can control the reflection coefficient as well. When you do a conventional type filter, you know those, those two things are kind of um, uh, independent. Of, well, they're not independent, but, but they're, it's already a given. You know, the, If you get one, you're gonna get the other. Um, or it's going to be what it is. In this case, it's like it's like an extra dimension. You have to try and control it once. And so, any kind of compensation uh, in the network has to sort of compensate things in two different ways, or else you're either going to give up your impedance match, or you're going to give up your filter response, which makes it kind of tricky. But but again, the uh, coupled uh, coupled inductors here is something you can compensate for. There is, of course, also stray coupling between these inductors as well, which um, which uh, might have been what you were referring to, um, and that in part 
is why you end up with you know these kinds of limiting uh, uh, attenuation as well as the imperfect uh, uh, impedance match that you get. And yeah, when I when I do design one of these filters, particularly when I design these planar types, uh, after the initial simulation, I do kind of spend some time tweaking and tuning to compensate for that. But I have to admit, I haven't really spent a lot of time doing a uh, uh, coming up with a theoretical, uh, you know, elegant way to do that. It's a little more cut and try. Okay, uh, thank you. I, I really hope that has answered the question. And so there is uh, one more question from Professor Chirodeep Mukherjee. He asks, what is the cutoff frequency for passband and stop band for the presented reflectionless filters? Cutoff frequency. So, um, uh, sorry, I'll just go back here. Um, so you can tune it uh, however you want. I mean, again, I did all of this derivation uh, using um, <clears throat> using ideal normalized elements right so it really just comes so there's sort of theory and then there's implementation the um lumped element designs the circuit i'm sorry the uh, discrete circuit board designs that i do i've done those you know typically tens to hundreds of megahertz like you could probably push that up to a gigahertz or so uh with you know high quality capacitors and inductors uh, any of the networks that require a transformer, you're going to be limited by where can you, you know, what, over what frequency range can you get a decent, you know, nearly ideal transformer or coupled inductors that you can sort of compensate for. The uh, mimic designs, the planar circuit designs, uh, like for many circuits, we've done those with cutoff corners. Um, for the low pass filters, I think we've done them as almost as high as 20 gigahertz. Uh, and then you'll have, again, we characterize one of the things you don't realize is that you know a reflectionless filter even if you're doing a narrow pass band it's a broadband circuit because you're trying to show good impedance well into the stop band so even though our cutoff corner might be 20 gigahertz typically your absorptive stop band your good impedance match extends up to 40 50 gigahertz typically um we've done high pass filters also with cutoffs um that will actually go higher i think 25 30 gigahertz um, at that point, um, the, it's what, what's really limiting you on the planar circuit design is those spiral uh, inductors. They're really low Q, unfortunately, um, and their parasitics get pretty bad. And, and as you go higher and higher in frequency, the inductor needs to have less and less inductance. And so, you know, at the lowest frequencies, when I'm doing a 100 megahertz design or something, I'll have a 15 turn inductor in there. As I move higher and higher in frequency, I start taking turns out, you know, and I end up with four turns, three turns, two turns, one turn. And once you're down to one turn of an inductor, it doesn't really act like an inductor anymore. It's it's more like a transmission line. And so you don't get the uh, cancellation of impedance. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't compensate the impedance of the capacitors in just the right way to give you that nice broadband reflectionless response. So that kind of is what limits your frequency range. But Again, quick answer to your question, uh, cutoff corners anywhere from hundreds of megahertz up to 20 or 30 gigahertz is what we're doing. Okay, Sorry, am I there? Just, uh, I was just talking, uh, keeping it muted. Sorry, okay. uh, thank you, thank you, Dr. Matthew. There's There are two more, three more questions in the panel. Uh, one question from Professor Parthopol. Sir, have you shown gain function of, or you have shown gain function of the filters? Can you comment on the phase response of these filters? Yes. Um, so, going to the lumped element designs, at least, it's a little easier to talk about. Um, I think I actually show some here. The uh, the response that you get is actually it's the same. It's exactly the same response you get in both transmission and reflection in both amplitude and phase as a canonical ladder filter of the same type. So if you do a Chebyshev type one filter with the ladder topology and you do a Chebyshev type one filter in the um, reflectionless topology, again, using ideal elements, you get exactly the same response in amplitude and phase. Uh, and same thing with the Chebyshev type two. Now you add a transformer, you know, the transformer ideally is just gonna give you a one-to-one -one coupling, but a real transformer is going to have some parasitic delay and, and, and whatnot, as would any even a, even an implementation of a conventional filter. But uh, like what I show here to kind of prove that point, it's not the phase exactly, but it's related, which is the uh, group delay. And I'm sorry, it's kind of the contrast is not so great in this picture that I lifted here. 
But this is the exact same group delay curve with you, both in value and in, and in shape that you'd get from a conventional ladder topology implementing the same response. Um, does that answer the question? Sure, it did. Uh, yeah. So uh, one question from uh, Shayok Pramanik. How is the role of response for this kind of filters? I'm sorry, how is the what of the response? The role of response. How is the roll off response? Um, well, I mean, you can kind of see the, the plot here the, in terms of what, what I would call selectivity. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's basically determined by the filter order and the type. Um, again, particularly with the mimic implementations, um, the cues are really low for these, uh, for these spiral inductors. And so there is a, a problem with losses. Excuse me. Um, such that the uh, corner itself becomes, I'm, I'm sort of showing apples and oranges here, let me go back. You know, it's, this is a planar design, so you can kind of see. So the corner itself becomes kind of rounded, but then it eventually reaches the same steepness as, as sort of the near optimal response. If you, if you were to plot it, I don't show it, but if you were to actually plot the ideal element response on top of this with the, uh, with the practical element response with all the parasitics included, the biggest difference would be right here in the corner where the where the ideal elements would be flatter and then come to a sharper corner, but then they would line up again by the time you, you got down here. So the losses kind of impact your your uh, your rounding off of the corners. And I guess that might be what you mean by, by roll off. Um, and because of that, honestly, I don't even try planar filters higher than about seventh order because you're just not gaining anything at that point you can make ninth order 11th order 13th order it's just not going to get any sharper here because you're limited by the queue of the inductors thank you so much uh, dr matthew P professor parthopal also has thanked you for the answer that you gave last time okay yeah, so uh, uh, there are two more questions in the panel i'm sure you, you'll be having time for that absolutely Okay, yeah. so one question is how to calculate inductor and capacitor value for higher frequency level? That is what Shurojit Shur is asking. Yeah, so I don't have a slide on that because I haven't shown it. Uh, it's it's the same as you would um, for a, ca a ladder type topology. So once you so you can look this up in textbooks, but if you <clears throat> if you have a prototype parameter, um, go back a little bit. Oops, going the wrong way. <laughs> So normally when you look at a ladder topology, right, your elements are labeled G1, G2, G3, and those are the normalized dimensionless quantities. Here I've kind of had to apply some formulas to tweak those numbers a little bit, but I've done it because that this way so that you can go to those same tables and those same textbooks and look up these numbers and their dimensionless quantities. But then essentially what you want to do, so for the, um, <clears throat> for the inductor, let's say, you want an inductance of L equals to Z naught over omega where Z naught is the characteristic impedance of your system. So it's really the impedance you're trying to match to, right? So if I wanna use a 50, if I'm making a 50 ohm system, for example, I want this circuit to be reflectionless into a 50 ohm source and load. Um, whereas, you know, it would not be reflectionless then into a 75 ohm source and load. You can make a 75 ohm reflectionless filter, but then you just have to scale your impedances differently. But so, what, so Z naught is your characteristic impedance. Omega is your radial angular frequency or two pi times F uh, frequency. And so L is just for a, for a low pass prototype here, L is just Z naught over omega. And um, uh, your capacitor, I'm sorry, Z naught over omega times whatever the prototype parameter value is. So for this inductor, it would be G2. And then uh, the capacitors are just Y naught over omega times, again, whatever the, whatever the label is here. And so that's how you can calculate. Uh, in some, in my references, uh, I've actually gone through that calculation as an example to kind of show how that works. I kind of glossed over it here because that's, uh, like I say, that's that's nothing novel in this. That's that's just the, I forget the name. There's a there's a name for those scaling functions, but um, it, it's it's essentially just scaling from uh, from an impedance of one ohm and an angular frequency of one radian per second scaling that up to whatever you know say 50 ohms and 10 gigahertz um i hope that answers the question <laughs> yeah i sh i'm sure that it uh, that it actually answered okay so he has just extended his question a little bit and saying that can we apply this for terahertz technology 
for terahertz technology? Yes. Um, in fact, I'm working. Uh, I've, I've had discussions with a professor of mine uh, at uh, UVA, University of Virginia, uh, thinking about doing something like that. So it's really a limited in um, whatever your fabrication approach is, right? So I've shown a, a lumped element version and I've shown a transmission line version. So I've actually talked to people. Whoops, hit, hit my touchpad, sorry. Um, I've actually talked to people. So if you can make, you know, a Pico Henry inductor, <laughs> then you know so as long as you can make the the values that that this topology calls for then you can make it at any frequency you want so if you have a fabrication technology with sufficient resolution uh and accuracy to make these really tiny element values you could scale it to terahertz and, and that is in fact i think what the professor at uva wants to do i think he is he is he's talking about hundreds of giga uh, several, many hundreds of gigahertz um but still doing it with lumped elements or you could go to the transmission line approach um, and which is a little easier to do at higher frequencies. And in fact, I talked to another professor about doing that on a on a quartz substrate uh, with niobium metallization, a superconducting metallization for cryogenically cooled circuits like we do in radio astronomy to get really high cues in those uh, bandpass transmission line types. So you can scale it to whatever frequency you want as long as you can provide the fabrication technology to do it. Um, the, the technology that we're using, uh, like for mini circuits, for example, we're kind of pushing the limits of that particular fabrication process for the lumped element design once we get to like 20, 30 gigahertz in terms of cutoff frequency. Okay, thank you. Uh, Professor Shurajit has also, Shurajit Shur has also thanked you for answering his question. Uh, okay. Last question in the panel as of now, uh, Professor Prashant Ranjan. In case of planar filter, how can we reduce the insertion loss between two ports? Um, I'm sorry, I said it again. In terms of the planar filter, how can we reduce the insertion loss between two ports? Yes, that was the question. Um, well, so that's, <clears throat> again, it's kind of a fabrication issue. And really, the insertion loss is primarily a, a consequence of the, um, the Q of the inductors, right? So. <clears throat> um, the theoretical response for ideal elements is, is no extra loss, it's zero dB. All of the loss that you see, let's see, I guess I have it, yeah, here, for example, um, is just due to parasitic ohmic losses in the inductors. Um, and I will say the high-pass filters are a little better than the low-pass filters, actually, which is one reason I like to show this one, uh, just because uh, the, the well into the pass band Really, most of the circuit is inactive except for the coupling capacitors in the high pass case. Uh, for the low pass filters in the pass band, you're mostly just going through a pair of inductors, and those inductors have more loss. So the Q of the inductors is worse than the Q of the capacitors. Um, so, how would you make it better? You'd have to have a fabrication technology that has better Q of inductors. So, I've seen things where people have done, you know, inductors, even printed inductors on planar circuits where they do like a micro electromechanical fabrication where they empty out a cavity underneath the, underneath the, the inductor um, or they'll, they'll float the inductor off the substrate a little bit so you can get some air under it so you don't, so, so that also helps with the uh, Q. Um, honestly, something that I've wanted to do that would make it a lot better, the reason the Q of the planar inductors is so poor in my, in, is partly because they're planar. If, if you could make them helical, if you can actually have a multi-layer process where you had turns of the inductor stacked vertically so that there was uh, more coupling from turn to turn, more magnetic flux coupling from turn to turn, you would get more inductance for less total length. And so you reduce the ohmic, the ohmic loss of, of your coil that way. And so simply from going by going from a purely planar one-dimensional design to a multi-layer three-dimensional design where you can actually have a proper helix for the inductor would improve the cues quite a bit, uh, and that would help reduce your insertion loss. But it's all of a, it's all again it's all a matter of what fabrication technology is available to you, and, and can you afford to pay for? Uh, it's all for the questions as of now, uh, because I don't find any more questions in the panel. But okay. uh, I would wholeheartedly thank Dr. Matthew Morgan for this wonderful lecture. And the engagement was really wonderful. Uh, there were many questions in the question panel. So I would like to end this session uh, at the moment. And I will request Dr. Matthew, if you have any final 
uh, words for the attendees. Uh, we are eager to hear from you. Okay, I, I, I just want to thank you all for the very warm welcome. Uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you this morning. And if anybody uh, thinks of any questions uh, afterward, uh, Bizwajit has my email address, and I'd be happy to, if you could forward those questions to me, I'd be happy to uh, correspond with you all. Thank you so much for attending. It's been really fun. Thank you. And thanks to all the attendees. Thank you, Dr. Morgan. Thank you to all the uh, members of this IEEE student branch. Thank you, all the professors. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you all. Thank you all. Take care, y'all.